In this video, I'm going to introduce you to CAD CAM programming and some of the differences between 2.5-axis machining and 3-axis machining using our Geneva drive wheel as an example. So, if you remember in lecture, you were presented with all these different steps it takes in order to go from CAD model to CNC machine part. It's not like 3D printing where you can just print out your model. First, you've got to start off with your CAD model. So in this case, we're using SOLIDWORKS as our CAD system. And in SOLIDWORKS, the model is designed, analyzed, in order for its fit and function in an assembly. And once we know that the model fits with the rest of the assembly features, we create what we call an engineering drawing, like you can see right here, in order to all the critical design features that this part has. So this part is part of the full Geneva wheel assembly. Looking at it, this is the Geneva drive wheel. And we've established the datum, the A datum, the primary one, on the surface that the part sits down on in the assembly. The secondary datum is going to be the center line of the part, so right in the middle of this part. So we're going to use those datums to set up our work coordinate system later on in the CAM system. And another step to CAD CAM programming is to study your engineering drawing. You always start in the bottom of your engineering drawing looking at the title block. The title block will tell you what type of material that we need to go ahead and make the part out of. So we're going to make this one out of 6061 T6 aluminum. And if you remember, machining is a subtractive process. So we have to come up with a stock size that our part fits within. Now looking at this part, you're going to see we have 2.73 inch diameter for the final diameter of the part. Well, we can order stock in square, round, rectangular cross sections. So in this case, we're going to order 2.75 inch round stock, and we're going to cut it on, a, on the saw to 0.75. If you look here, our final length dimension on the part is 0.6. And we're going to cut it a little bit longer, so we have some material to grab onto for the, for the first couple of operations. And we can't cut it to exactly 0.6 because we'll get a bad surface finish on the different surfaces, like you saw in IME 145. And we can't get that plus or minus 5,000 tolerance with a saw, with our band saw. So going back to the steps right here, you're going to see we have our CAD model. Our CAD model allowed us to generate an engineering drawing with all the important dimensions for the design. We look at that drawing, and we establish the job parameters, such as stock shape slash size, and then the coordinate system. So let's go back to the drawing real quick. So we're going to go 2.75 inch diameter by 0.75 length of cut on our extrusion. Once we cut that, we're going to actually make the zero point right in the center of our part. So the XY zero is going to be right kind of where our B datum is. When we first have raw stock, we don't have any datums, so to say. Our first machining operation is going to qualify the datums. So when we use a face mill to face the part, we're going to face off and qualify the A datum. Then we're going to use in mills to contour the part and contour that 2.73 inch diameter that's going to establish kind of where the outside of our B datum lies. Our B datum is really right in the center of the part, but we're going to grab it by the round. So we're also going to go ahead and use soft jaws for this operation since we don't have any flat edges to go ahead and grab on the stock. You never want to grab on round stock just by two points. We want a minimum of three points of contact, like using a V-jaw. Or, in our case, we're going to contour a 2.75 inch round hole in our soft jaw on our vise in order to grab the stock. So, let's move back to the steps. You're going to see, we now know where our work coordinate system is going to go, and basically our stock size. The next step is to analyze the drawing and figure out what CNC machining processes we need in order to remove the material from the raw stock and generate the part like you see right here. So looking at that drawing, we're going to establish the datums first. So we're going to cut the back side of this part, establish the A datum and the B datum. To do that, we're going to need a face mill, the saw cut stock, and get a nice flat A datum right there. So we're going to come up with face milling first. Then we're going to go ahead and rough out the, the, the cam profile on the part with an end mill. So we'll contour around there and basically rough that out. Next, 
we've got to go ahead and cut out the 2.73 inch diameter and kind of establish a machine surface to locate our B datum off of. So we'll do that. Then we're going to go ahead and drill these holes all in this operation. And some of them have a really tight tolerance, so we can't get away with just drilling. We have to drill and then ream, for example, this 249 to 248 hole with the limits dimensions. Finally, after we've done ma the major machining processes, you'll notice that we have chamfer. The typical chamfer is 10 thou by 45 degrees on this part. So we'll use our spot drill to go ahead and chamfer the part and create chamfers on the cam profile, the outside, and then the holes as well. At that point, we're going to need to then flip over the part, remove any of the remaining stock that we were holding on to, and produce this three-axis contour right here on the, on the top of the part, right here for this little, this little round protrusion that has the 0.15 radii. The reason we can't use ball end mills, we can't use fractional size ball end mills just to generate a 125 radius is because the engineer designed this to have a 0.15 radius. This was done on purpose to show you how three axis tool paths are different than two and a half axis tool paths. And then we'll end up roughing out all the material around the protrusion. We use three axis tool paths to basically contour this protrusion and then we'll chamfer it and engrave it and our part should be done. So let's go back to our steps. We've kind of figured out the different machining processes that needed to occur for that. With those machining processes, we need to use cutting tools to remove that material. So we have to go to our cutting tool library or our cutting tools that we have available for us and figure out which cutting tools we're going to use for the different operations and then figure out the machining parameters that go with those cutting tools. The machining parameters include depth of cut, width of cut or step over, surface speed to figure out the RPM, chip load to figure out the table feed rate, and so forth. So let's go to the CAM system and see how that all works. Moving over to the CAM system, you'll see we have SolidWorks here. So we modeled it in SolidWorks. Now we went to Autodesk.com and downloaded HSMWorks. HSMWorks is a free CAM add-in for SolidWorks. Once you add that to your SOLIDWORKS, anybody can do it. You could go do that right after this video. You could click on CAM, and we have all the different steps needed in order to produce a CNC program from our CAD model in SOLIDWORKS here. Also, when you download SOLIDWORKS, you get this little in mill tab right here, which allows us to set up all the different CNC machining operations. So just like we talked about, we actually have two different jobs right here that are op one and op two in order to complete the part. The third job is the soft jaw machining program in order to machine the custom shaped jaws to hold the part for both operations. We're gonna pretty much just focus on CNC op one and CNC op two in this video. So you start creating operations in HSM works by selecting a job. When you select a job, you'll see a window comes up and it's the job window. I go over here and modify this one. In that job, you've got to go ahead and decide what type, what model you want to go ahead and select the machining geometry off of. So what we ended up doing is just selecting the entire model here, and we'll end up having that become our job. Basically, you'll see it highlights in blue. So we're going to use that model, the only model we have. You can do this in assemblies. That's why they give you a selection. But we have the model now in blue. Next, we have to pick our stock size. So we came up with a, we came up with a cylindrical stock that we're going to order. That cylindrical stock is going to have a 10 thou radial offset. That's 20 So if I go back to the drawing, you're going to see that we have a 0.27 or 2.73 diameter. If I had 10 thou radially on both sides, I end up with 2.75. Then we have a 0.6 overall length of the part. However, we decided to cut the stock at 0.75. So you'll notice we're going to add 25 thou to the top of the part, which will face mill off and qualify that 8 atom. We're going to add an eighth of an inch below to help us grip onto the part while machining it in the actual soft jaw.
So we have the 25th thou and the 125. The last couple of things you do in the job are you select where you want your work coordinate system. For this operation, we're going to go ahead and touch all of our tools off the bottom of the vise, where the, where the part's sitting, so the bottom of the soft jaw, where the, part, where the stock sits in there. That's why our Z is set at the bottom of the stock. And we're going to put the X and Y zero in the center of the part, like you see right here. So I ended up just using stock and orientation, and I picked basically the bottom center of the model. So that sets up my work coordinate system, or my G54. Last but not least, you can give it a program name. Remember the Haas code, or you're going to learn when you, when you do the Haas mill training, that the, the program is a five-digit number. So this one happens to be a 5600 or 50,600 for the program name. Because not all operators understand the numbers, the number naming convention, you can put it in the program comment, Geneva Drive Wheel Op 1, and that'll show up when we post-process the code. Last but not least, we're going to use G59 or 58 for this work offset. So we added 4 to G54, giving us a G58 work offset. Remember, there's G54 through 59 are the standard work coordinate systems you can call up when generating CNC code. So when we're happy with our job, we hit the check mark, and we now can start creating tool paths. You're going to see all the tool paths that you can create are right here on these menus. So I can do drilling operations. I can do two and a half axis operations. So all the 2D milling are really two and a half axis. What that means is the tool doesn't move in all three axes simultaneously. For example, if most common two axis tool paths drop down for the depth of cut and then move over in the X and Y axes to remove the material. So you'll see we have face, adaptive clearing, pocket, and 2D contour. They're some of the very popular uh, tool paths available for two and a half axis milling. Back in my day, when I first started machining, we really only had pocket, contour, and face. We, those were the main two-axis tool paths that, that you really needed to know how to use. And over the years, they've developed a couple more different two-axis tool paths that are custom to doing specific things like thread milling, um, a bore, and, and so forth, chamfering and engraving. But you can really get away with face, pocket, and contour on a lot of different parts, on most parts. Now, Three-axis toolpaths generate 3D toolpaths. So you can have a line of code where X, Y, and Z all interplate in one line in order to make a, a non-flat surface. So we're going to use that when we get over to this side of the, to the part where we have to go ahead and cut this, this rounded protrusion. For example, we're going to go ahead and finish this rounded profile right here, which it's going to move X, Y, and Z in this same toolpath maybe all at once in one line of code. Now, we'll talk about a little bit more about those later. So, we're going to focus now on the different machining operations required to machine OP1 here. So we came up with that based off of our engineering drawing. We figured out that based off the different features, we need a face to qualify that A datum. We need to rough out the material around the cam finish the outside profile, finish the cam, and then do all the drilling operations. So what you end up doing in HSM Works is you pick these different machining operations and then select geometry on your part that the tool needs to follow or avoid. So what we're going to do is the first one is face mill. By going to face mill, you'll see right here when we select face mill, we right click and we come up with five different tabs we need to fill out in order to get the CAM programming accomplished. Those five different tabs allow us to pick our tool, the, geom the driving geometry we want to machine, our different heights, our step over, and our cutting parameters, basically. And last but not least, our lead in and lead outs and how we're going to approach the part. It's called linking. So going back to the PowerPoint bullets, you're going to see we're, we're now going to basically select different machining processes, use different cutting tools, and driving geometry on the model in order to create a tool path. Let's move back to HSM Works. The first tool we're going to use is our 2-inch face mill. It happens to be tool number 10 loaded up in the mini mills. So when I go to my tool library right here, you're going to see I can build a new mill tool. I'm actually just going to click on the current one we have and show you how that works. So the general tab right here allows me to pick the tool number, 
the height offset number than the diameter offset if I'm using cutter comp. In this case, it's tool number 10, length 10, diameter 10 in our mini mill. Now, the next thing is the type of cutter. So tool 10 is actually a face mill. So I pick face mill. I pick the diameter of my face mill. Then I can set up all the flute lengths, how big the tool is for the simulation right there. For now, I'm, the main thing that we're really worried about is the diameter of the tool in this menu and the type of tool. So, after you pick out the type of cutter that you're using, you can go into the feeds and speeds page where you select the surface speed, which is going to calculate the spindle speed. In this case, we the Sandovic inserts that we're using run a 3250 surface speed recommended for aluminum. So remember, surface speed is based off your tool material and your workpiece material. So that 3250 actually gives us 6200 RPM roughly. Well, the mini mills can only spin at 6000 RPM, so we're limited by our spindle speed. So we select RPM, which then calculates the surface speed. They're interrelated, but you, the main goal is you want to stay, under the recommended surface, stay within the recommended surface speed that cutting tool manufacturer advises for that cutting tool and that type of material. So that's the speeds. That'll go ahead and be how surface speed calculates RPM. Next is the table feed rate. The table feed rate, if you remember from IME 145, is calculated in inches per minute. That's calculated by multiplying the spindle speed by the feed per tooth by the number of teeth or flutes that the cutter has. So 6 times 4 times 0 0.002 is roughly 48. So when I press OK, I have my tool all set up and I select that tool. Now, this tool page is done. I could go ahead and modify this ones that I just set up in the library, or I can use the ones in the library. So we're going to just go ahead and use the ones that we set up in the library values. So when I click on this next one, this is the geometry we want to select to actually cut our part. So our part, we want to go ahead and face the full outside of the part. So we're going to select that entire outside right there. And we have, you'll see it sets up where the actual stock will be for that it's going to face. Next, we have our heights. The heights are going to be where it clears when it moves around from toolpath to toolpath. The retract height where it's going to pull up to. Then the feed height where it's going to wrap it down to before it feeds down into the cut. And then where the top of the stock is and where the bottom of the cut is. So top is going to be stock top, bottom is going to be our model top, which is going to give us a 25 thou depth of cut between the two. So you see I go from there to there, and it's slightly changed on the screen. So that's how I select how deep I want to cut my overall depth. Now the next tab is going to be the step over, and the multi if you want to do multiple depths, it'll be your depth of cut, how many finish passes you want to make, and so forth. So on this one, we're going to step over 1.75, so end up doing two passes over the part, and we're going to do one depth, so we're not going to click on multiple depths and give it a specific depth of cut or finishing pass. Last but not least, we have the linking menu. The linking menu allows me to do lead in and lead outs, so I can start off the stock and basically arc in, or I could ramp in, in a pocket I can, I can helix in, and so forth. So for right now, we're going to go ahead and hit check mark. And the CAM system creates basically a toolpath cutter, lo cutter location data. This cutter location data will later on be interpreted by the post processor and make the G code. So anything in blue is a feed, anything in green is a lead in, and yellow is basically a wrap in. So that's our first toolpath. Now looking back at the different steps, we have to verify our toolpath before we're ready to post it. So looking back at SOLIDWORKS, to verify it, we can either simulate it right here on the solid model to make sure the tool is not going to crash into our model or any of our fixtures if we had that selected. So when I press play, I'm going to speed it up a little bit. And you're going to see the cutter goes around the part and does its face pass. Now, that didn't give me a solid model simulation. Stock simulation will go ahead and do that. It brings in your, your stock that you selected, and when you press play, it'll go ahead and show you what the part looks like and show you the wireframe edges of the model below it. 
So right there, that looks pretty good. We're gonna remove 25 thou and qualify the A data. Now, the next tool path we're gonna do is we're gonna rough out everything around the part around the cam. To do that, that's gonna be a 2D adaptive clearing. What that does is we take an end mill and we basically clear out all this material inside the part. In fact, I'll show you a simulation of it real quick so you can kind of see what that looks like. When I press play, the face mill goes over it, and then the end mill is going to come in and step over the amount we prescribed in the cut control menu in order to basically remove the material. Now you'll see this tool path leaves a little bit of stock so we can come back and do a finish pass around the cam and get the cam profile precise. All right. So let's go back over here. Let's check out the, let's check out this tool path just real quick. So this time our cutting tool ended up being a 3 8 end mill. It's a three flute. So it's gonna run at 6,000 RPM and 6,000 RPM times two inch, two thou inch per tooth chip load times three ends up being a per minute feed rate. So we're gonna do 36 inches per minute at 6,000 RPM around this part. The geometry we want for our stock contours is going to be the outside profile. And then the model, the other model is going to be the entire model we want to go ahead and cut. And it will avoid the, the profile right there. Now, next, we're going to go ahead and look at our heights. So our clearance height and our retract height are above the part. We're going to start cutting at the model top this time, right where we left off with the face mill last time. And we're going to end up stop cutting from the contour down here. You'll see right there, that's selected. So at this point, we go over to our cut control menu, and you'll see we have a 0.1 step over. What that means is we're going to step over our width of cut as 100 thou as we spiral in here and remove all that material in one pass, one depth. Now, in order to leave stock on the edges of this profile out here, I'm going to go ahead and click on stock to leave, and it'll leave 10 thou on the outside of this profile. Last but not least, you'll see we have any type of lead in or lead outs that are set up just in case we want to go ahead and arc into our cut and not engage the cutter right on the stock instantly. So when I hit check mark, it generates that tool path, and we just watched it simulate, so we'll be okay with that. And we're now ready to go on to our next tool path. Our next tool path is a contour tool path where we're gonna contour the outside profile of the part, which allows us to then grab onto that profile in the second CNC operation and, then, and use kind of the center of that profile as our datum B. I've already qualified our datum A. Now we're kind of qualifying basically where our datum B is gonna be located in the center line of that dimension, the 2.73 dimension. The next tool path we do is a contour. So it's gonna contour around here at the cam. And we're ready to go ahead and go on to the whole processes. The whole processes go ahead and we spot drill first with our tool five, the five eighths countersink that we used in IME 145. In fact, all this tooling we use in IME 145 except for the, the, the C size drill and the reamer. So then we countersink that fastener hole. We drill the C size hole here and the C size drill is smaller than that quarter inch because we have to ream it at 0.249 in order to press fit a pin into the Geneva drive wheel. So we drill then we ream then we drill the other holes with the F size drill and last but not least we use our chamfer tool to chamfer the part like you see right there. And those are all the different operations we need to go ahead and machine and CNC op one based off of our engineering drawing and the different machining methodology we came up with at the beginning of this video. So now when I move back to SolidWorks and I click on OP1, I can simulate this operation virtually and see what it looks like after it's all done cutting compared to my solid model in SolidWorks. So when I press play, you're gonna see it's slowly contouring. We got a little faster here. Whoops, I was too fast. Uh, let me just do that one more time fine line right there. So when we hit play and restart it, you'll see it's contouring. Then it comes in, it finishes the outside, finishes that, 
and we end up with a different color for each toolpath. But that's what our parts should look like upon successful machining of CNC op one. You can see our surfaces look very close to the actual solid model surfaces that they're actually laying on top of each other right there. So you can kind of see a break in the graphics control or in the video. So now we've got this model. If I wanted to right click and save stock as, I could save this as an STL and 3D print my CNC operation I just performed in order to test out fixturing for subsequent operations. But I'm gonna hit cancel for right now and check mark. So CNC op one is done. CNC op two, we're gonna flip the part over. This time our work coordinate system is gonna be on the ADM is gonna be on the machine surface. So looking back at the drawing, we're gonna locate off the ADM and the machine surface there. We've cut a soft jaw pocket that has this profile in it in order to orient or clock the cam with the holes in this operation. So we can chamfer the three different holes you'll see right here. And we'll end up then removing all this extra material on the top, leaving the hole or leaving the circle right here and then allowing us to go ahead and machine using a ball end mill to do three axis tool paths and get that 3D surface that we have on the top of our part on our Geneva drive wheel. Last but not least, we'll chamfer and then engrave manufacturing engineering in, into the part. So let's look at that real quick. When we move over here, we have our first face mill tool path, same two inch face mill tool path. So the two inch face mill is gonna come here, but this time, we're going to, if you look at it, we have to take off an eighth of an inch of material back there. So we're gonna do a 50 thou depth of cut three times in order to get that done. And we're gonna use that same feeds and speed, same face mill that we did in op one. Our contour is gonna be the outside of the profile of the part again. And then our depths are really gonna go from stock top down to the top of the, the surface right here that we're, that we're gonna generate later on with the 3D tool paths. Now, the step over is the same 1.75 and it creates those tool paths. So at this point, we're now gonna rough the part using a two axis adaptive clearing and we're going to avoid, we're basically going to avoid this surface right here, we don't wanna go ahead and cut out anything inside of here because the 3D surface, we're gonna use our three axis or 3D milling tool paths in order to generate these, these curved surfaces using a ball end mill. So we then rough out the surface leaving stock with a ball end mill and we finish the surface. Now 3D tool paths, you commonly use ball end mills and, the, and they use surface geometry to identify the toolpath as opposed to wireframe edges like we've done on a lot of the two and a half axis toolpaths. So when we have here is we have our machining boundary, we're gonna go ahead and machine just this part in blue. And that's why all these faces were highlighted. So the ball end mill will follow on its tangent edge all the way through the, these, this cut in order to generate that 0.15 inch, 1.5, Inch, or 0.15 inch radius. Now, the, the basically the model top, model top, model top, and model bottom, it's just gonna look at the surfaces we select and stop the toolpath based on those points. Now the step over is going to be, it's a radial toolpath. We're gonna basically give it a, basically a, a 40 thou cusp height right there at three degrees. So if we move over every three degrees, and follow that surface, we'll end up with a little 40 thou cusp height. So what that means is if I moved over four degrees, our cusp height gets bigger and bigger because it's less amount of tool paths or passes. And you can kind of see right here what a cusp height is. The ball end mill leaves a little cusp because it doesn't have a flat surface like a regular end mill. So last but not least are our lead ins. So when we hit the check mark, you're gonna see that we have our 3D tool paths that were driven off the surface model as opposed to wireframe edges like the two and a half axis tool paths were. So we've got our 3D in 3D surface there. In fact, let's look at those three tool paths in simulation real quick. Press play. Now we're using the ball end mill to rough it. We rough out that tool path. Now we finish it going in this direction radially. 
and make a nice smooth surface finish on our part. Now the only thing we're missing at this point is we're missing the chamfering the outside. So we're just gonna use the spot drill to run a contour around the outside and chamfer it. Then we do a little drilling routine to chamfer those two holes. So remember it's clocked in the soft jaw with, uh, based off the 88M in this cam and held on the outside diameter. And the zero point is the center or the B datum. So we'll move over here. We will chamfer the, the top of the handle right there. And then last but not least, we'll contour or we'll engrave the manufacturing engineering logo. Reason I didn't use the engraving toolpath and cut away all this was cycle time. We have to we would have had to produce 185 of these parts in our lab this quarter. And if we add a lot of cycle time to the part, it wouldn't be possible to get it done in one in one lab period. So for all 24 students, 185 total between all eight sections. So now that we have all of the tool paths established, we post process the CNC operations. Let's go back and look real quick. So post processing allows us to generate G code. So when we created all these tool paths in here, from here to here, you'll see we ended up creating all these, these lines. These lines represent feeds, rapid moves, and lead in, lead out moves. So they have feeds and speeds associated with them and X, Y, Z data based off the Cartesian coordinate system and the work coordinate system being zero right down here. So when I hit post process, I'm allowed to pick the type of machine tool I have. Post processor generates G and M code that's machine tool specific. So for the Haas machine, we have a Haas post processor. We have our comment here and our program name. So when I hit post, and I hit sure replace it, it'll go ahead and generate all the G code required in order to cut the part based off of my CAD CAM inputs that I input with you in this video. So moving down through, you'll see there's a lot of code, a lot more than just that manual programming assignment that you performed in lab. When I move all the way down here, we end up with basically 1400 lines of code. Imagine trying to write that in an afternoon. That's why industry uses CAD CAM system as, a, as opposed to manual programming. Also, um, a good thing to have in the, in the, the post processor would be the drawing. So you put Geneva drive wheel, and then you put the drawing revision. I don't know what the rev is off the top of my head. I'll just do XXX so you can refer to the drawing when producing this part and then a tool list showing you what the tool is and kind of a little explanation of the tool. Also, a lot of times you put where the work coordinate system is and little setup instructions up here in the comments. So anything in a CNC program that's in parentheses ends up being a comment. But you'll see what we have is we have T10M6, so tool 10, tool change, S6000M3, so it turns on the spindle, the M3, and then G57, I think I said 58 earlier, but it's the difference between Mastercam and HSM works. They have a, a four would have been G58 in Mastercam. Uh, four in, in HSM works is a G57. Not a big deal, but that's the work coordinate system we'd set up on. And turning on the coolant, then it calls up the height offset. It gets tool three ready if we had a drum ready to go for if we had a super speed machine or basically non umbrella style tool changer. So that's really meaningless. Then it goes around and basically does G1s, G2s, G0s, and G3s, the basic G codes required to make the world, really. So if you think about it, most everything in the world can be made with a line and an arc. So that's all the code. You have all your code. I'm not going to save the changes right now. You'll see we would then, whoops, we would then go to the machines. We would transfer that G code to the machine via Ethernet, via USB. Then we'd have to set up the machine by cutting the soft jaw set, setting the work coordinate system, and touching off all the tools, which you'll learn about as we go through the CNC mill operator training this quarter. So hopefully, they gave you a little insight into how two-axis and three-axis toolpaths are different and how the Geneva drive wheel for our class was actually cut. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at tgiorgio at calpoly.edu or Stop by my Zoom office hours this quarter or office hours in person any other quarter. Have a great day.